Hello everyone. Today I'm meeting one psycho meeting another psycho. So a psychologist from Mexico meeting psychologist from California. Hello, Matt. Hello, Julia. So good to be with you today. How are you? I'm very good. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're both in a good weather. So because all research shows that when it's good weather, we're all in our moods are lifted and we're more optimistic and life seems not so bad. I'm glad you're having some good weather there. We had a few torrential downpours here and windstorms and uh, we experienced what it was like to live without power for a bit and it was all very exciting and I'm grateful to be alive. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that. And let's talk about storms and this kind of things from human perspective. So when it happens, your own personal storm, which is very often not believing in yourself. I want to talk about with you about our self-esteem, because this is what m people very often come to psychologists uh, for. They're saying, I don't believe in myself. I have low self-esteem. What can I do? And the first question is, is believing in yourself and self-esteem from your perspective, not theoretical, but from your perspective as a therapist, is it the same? The question is, is uh, self-esteem and believing in yourself the same? Yeah. Well, self-esteem is... Um, uh, a bit mysterious. So let's see if we can decode what's happening there and understand low self-esteem. And then there can also be problems with excessively high self-esteem. And there's a process that you can go through to get self-esteem and feel uh, overcome feelings that are associated with depression. And so when people are feeling depressed, they're often feeling uh, a sense of worthlessness or inadequacy, or shame or guilt. And for a long time, there was a mystery. Why, why do we feel this way? And uh, in the 1960s, uh, cognitive therapists uh, began to kind of rediscover an ancient truth, which is that our feelings are caused by our thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's not reality uh, so much as our perceptions of reality that are dictating how we feel. So, for example, if I just think, if I just think, oh my gosh, I've lost my wallet, I'll feel very upset and panicked, even if my wallet is actually just right there and I just didn't see it. And and so understanding that is really the fulcrum that allowed some of the CBT therapists to get um, traction and help people with depression. And well, what they, yeah. this because this is a great example. I want to understand it better because from my like if you lost your wallet you can say lost my wallet you can say well i did not even like it so what kind of thought do you have or you can say oh my god that was all my money and my everything there so is it just the fact that you lost your wallet is important on how you make interpretation of what happened yeah so the, there are these things called automatic negative thoughts that it's sort of our own internal uh monologue and when we're listening to that and believing our own propaganda, it, and it's telling us, oh, I'm a loser, I'm worthless, I'm defective, I'm so stupid for losing my wallet, how could I have done this? Those are the types of thoughts that people are having when they feel worthless and, and mm -hmm. defective. Uh, and and um, in, in the Buddhist tradition, there's the story of the two arrows, right? The, the first arrow is a real one. You ride out to war and you get hit by an arrow, and then the subsequent arrows are you telling yourself, oh, I should have known better. I shouldn't have ridden out to war. I should have purchased that armor. I'm such a, this always happens to me. And so it's identifying the inner bully, the inner critic that is uh, criticizing us and, and telling us these negative thoughts uh, that was so helpful in, in understanding the source of uh, low self-esteem and, and other feelings states as well. So the, the concise version of this is that uh, we feel we feel the way we think, and that is that is the cognitive model, in a nutshell, and that is the basis of uh, traditional CBT. Uh, and, and so, for example, one of the earliest treatments in traditional CBT uh, for a woman who was suffering from severe low self-esteem, and, and she was convinced that she was worthless and no good. They, they had her, uh, they gave her a homework exercise. And the homework was to write down the evidence. What is the evidence that you're worthless? And what is the evidence that you're worthwhile? 
And she returned the next week, and she looked like a different human being. Uh, she had previously been kind of disheveled, and she was obviously not valuing herself or taking good care of herself. But when she arrived the next week, she was upbeat and perky and happy and, you know, had done her hair and was wearing a nice dress. And they said, "What? well, what happened? And she said, well, I did the homework exercise, and I realized I was just conning myself, that the story I had about myself, that I was worthless and no good, it doesn't match the evidence at all. And she, she showed all of the, the things that she'd written about how she had, you know, worked so hard during her life to put her, her kids through school and had taken care of them and took, taken to the doctor and showered them with love and, and how hard she had worked and she'd achieved like a great deal of skill playing the piano and, and as an artist and in her community she was active and, and people really admired her and looked up to her and, and she was able to see that and see through her thinking and she, and she no longer believed that she was worthless. And that's when she recovered. It's, it was in that moment that she stepped out of that way of thinking that had just been a habit, something that she told herself without closely examining uh, its truth value. Let me ask you a question, yeah. because from the way it, um, you tell it, it's, it, it sounds like it's that simple. The moment you realize it, you're being healed. But we both know from therapy process, sometimes just realizing and knowing it's not enough. We who study psychology, we very often in a process do realize stuff, but the knowledge about myself sometimes is simply not enough. So how is it happening that I believe that there are some examples that somebody realized it and feel like transformation, but very often, uh, Matt, it does not really happen, does it? It doesn't. And that was, that was what actually started David Burns's, uh, developing the new type of CBT was mm -hmm. that a, a large number of people could understand the model. They could, they could grasp, they could notice that they were having negative thoughts and they could even argue back against the negative thoughts in a variety of ways in an intellectual level mm -hmm. without experiencing anything at the gut level. Nothing was changing in terms of their feeling state. And, and so David asked the question, well, why is that? Why, why are, you know, 40, 50% of people just not getting better? And they se seem to have the same thoughts as these folks who are getting better. Yeah. And, and so what was the missing ingredient? And it turns out there were quite a few. The team psychotherapy is, is the uh, new and improved type of CBT. And it adds in a number of different additional models, not just the cognitive and the behavioral model, but perhaps most importantly, the motivational model. And whereas the, the, the old model said, we, we feel the way we think, we're, we're feeling worthless or low self-esteem because mm -hmm. of our thought process. We're telling ourselves we're worthless. Uh, David's model says, suggests something else, uh, which, which is that we feel uh, low self-esteem, we feel worthless uh, as a part of our value system. Mm -hmm. and, and and that there's a part of us that has high standards for us and, and would not want to accept this version of us mm -hmm. that, that we want to improve. And there's this sense that if I'm kind of beating up on myself, maybe that'll give me the motivation I need. And, and so he noticed that there was this type to improve. And, and so he noticed that there was this, these different forms of resistance so that even if someone could see at an intellectual level that they couldn't possibly be worthless, right? That, that's a state of perfection. To be perfectly worthless would mean you would never do anything worthwhile at all. And, and you could see logically, well, that's impossible. Even if I tried as hard as I could to be t perfectly worthless, I would mess up and do worthwhile things occasionally or anything I did would have some value. And, and so uh, the, that's insufficient. And, and what David realized is we need to understand what are the barriers to recovery? Why would people, and I, what I was just talking about was outcome resistance. Let's say you could get self-esteem right now and it's just as easy as pressing a button. Mm -hmm. there, there are going to be some reasons not to press that button. And, and part of them is like high standards. I don't want 
like if I failed my biology test, let's say, I, I don't want to feel good about that. I, I want to get an A. Yeah. Right. And so if the motivation is, to, is an improvement rather than approving of ourselves, yeah, then we've got a, a, a motivational conflict and, and we need to bring that resistance to the surface and talk about it. Talk about all the good reasons why we would not want to press that button, even if we would experience relief. Uh, if we did, that there, there's a part of us that will not want to press that button, and for very good reasons, very admir admirable reasons, based on a desire I, to improve. Yeah, go ahead. Do we have any data that shows what is actually works better when we, um, in order to improve ourselves, when we saying these things? Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not smart enough, so I need to work harder in order to get A from biology test. Or when we have positive self-talk to say, well, this time maybe I did not work hard enough or that the question were not exactly that I thought that's going to be it, but if I'm going to work harder, I'm going to make it happen. So which strategy works? Do we have any data on this? Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of data in the, in the literature uh, and ways of measuring, well, what, which approach is better? And um, one interesting study was they had people learning a video game. And one group was told, what, we want you to take this very seriously. And if you make some mistake, uh, be harsh with yourself and demand better uh, play and, and tell yourself you're no good and, and you should have been doing better. Yeah. And then they had another group that said, hey, just play around and have fun. The, the goal of this game is just to enjoy yourself and experiment and be curious and uh, and if you if you goof up, that's not a big deal at all. And if you do mm -hmm. goof up, just tell yourself no big deal. And the learning differences, the the skill level acquisition uh, rate was extremely high for the group that uh, was just lighthearted and playing and curious and having a good time. The group that was constantly beating up on themselves and criticizing themselves, uh, they felt worse and they performed worse. And we, we know through multiple different studies uh, that this kind of punishing motivation, it, it may work in a very, very short term, uh, but it fails in the long term. It leads, leads to uh, depression. And we know that folks with depression have difficulty with concentration and mm. their performance in general. And, and so that's one good argument against this idea that, oh, I've got to beat up on myself to improve, uh, is, is actually that that doesn't work. Identi identifying things that we're excited about and, and uh, you know, the, using the carrot rather than the whip is the most effective uh, form of motivation. Um, and it's been studied in animals, too. Uh, the original dolphins at SeaWorld were trained using um, uh, these horse breaking techniques. They had uh, folks who had were used to kind of punishing horses into getting them to do what they wanted. When they tried that on the dolphins, which is which are a very social, intelligent creature, uh, they they all just kind of became depressed and were hanging out at the bottom of the tank and not doing any type of tricks uh, for the trainers. And they had to release those dolphins, and then they brought in a group of behavioralists who understood, let's just give positive feedback for incremental change. Anytime they saw the dolphins doing something even close to what they wanted, they would give them a lot of rewards and, and fish and affection. And pretty soon they had the dolphins jumping through hoops and doing backflips and that kind of thing. Uh, two questions here. That is uh, yeah. so interesting what you're saying. First is um, how do you connect this to to different feelings that you you like what we know from what he said it's better to have positive self talk when something bad happens so it's more motivational for you like for to achieve more but in the same time you do feel sad and upset and maybe you even do know that you did not work as hard as you should maybe you like you know went to the party because you thought you're well prepared so maybe you did something that that was not actually the best thing in the world to do it. How do you connect these two feelings in order to uh, to make it effective, but not to suppress any 
of them, not to make it fake this positivity, like to say, I'm doing it because I was told to do it. And in the same time, not to suppress that you're a human being and you may be self-conscious person and you honest with yourself and you just screwed up. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can answer that question. Uh, there was a part of it that I heard you say that you, you might still feel regretful or embarrassed or a little ashamed if you're telling yourself, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I, I, yeah. should, have, I should have studied. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have gone out to that party. And, yeah. and those, are, those are the cognitions. The, uh, the uh, should statements are one of the key um, ways in which our thinking gets distorted when we're depressed. Mm -hmm. When, when we're, we're telling ourselves, I shouldn't be this way, I should be better, I'm not good enough. And, and, it, and that's, that's the thinking that would have to be addressed if someone wanted to feel better. Um, and another answer to your, to your question is, is t it's sometimes helpful to realize that there's no amount of beating up on myself that um, you know, leads to a better performance. That, that motivation is a different uh, problem. If we have low motivation, there are a lot of different ways to address that. Uh, but but whipping ourselves is um, uh, you know just hurts and it feels bad and we can go on doing that for a long time uh, w without anything changing in our life and so if you're if you're wanting to overcome procrastination and to and to increase your uh, study improve your study habits that's one type of problem but if you're wanting to overcome self-esteem problems and, and get your sense of worth back that's a different different uh, kind of problem uh, but they are connected <clears throat> for example if I think that I'm worthless and defective and no good will I think that uh, it's very likely that I'll succeed or will I feel hopeless mm -hmm. if I am worthless if I'm defective then it would follow that I'm it's also hopeless for me and so I won't try and, and so that that's actually the impact of depression is that people withdraw. They don't they don't want to go out there and fail their way to success because they're afraid of failure. They're certain that they're going to fail, and they think that's some bad thing that they shouldn't fail, right? That they should succeed all the time, and that and and so that that's the nature of that's the connection between uh, low self esteem and, and telling ourselves we're worthless and low motivation, which is there's no point trying. Yeah. Does it mean, Matt, that we have different strategies or methods to work with uh, self-esteem as something that is like our psychological DNA that can be changed and with uh, changing habits, like, for example, procrastination, so something that leads to um, an effective behavior? Exactly. So we would want to identify the thoughts that are causing procrastination and treat those with a certain type of methodology and and then uh, address the the thoughts that cause low self esteem and feelings of worthlessness with a different methodology. So we definitely get back to this because it's very interesting. But the, my second question to what you said is, you know, right now it's a huge discussion about how to bring up kids and should we give awards or should we do punishment? What really works? We had this uh, idea before that we reward everything that was actually very popular in the states so everybody is a winner there is no loser so we create completely a bubble that does not exist no matter if you last or first you still get an award we know it does not work we also does not work from uh, data from psychology that punishment does not really work kids will do something because they fear not because they learn but there is also notion of something that i also not exactly agree with and i'm wondering of your opinion and if you can have also some data on this that also we should not reward our kids so from what even say from dolphins like rewarding them makes them perform better so if dolphins perform better how come we and our kids would not perform better if you say good job you did it. I'm so proud of you. Like, let's go to have ice cream because I see how hard you work. So what do you think should we use in bringing up our kids rewards or we should try to be no, like it's, uh, I think it's popular in, um, uh, in, uh, in some north of, uh, 
of uh, positive uh, discipline. No rewards, no punishments. What do you think about this? <laughs> That's interesting. I, I mean, I do have one. I'm not a child psychiatrist, and I haven't studied this extensively. Uh, but one one thing I uh, think that kind of makes sense to me is that I think in the past there's been too much emphasis on rewarding uh, the outcome of behavior, meaning that if someone gets a good grade, they might get a re special reward or a good job or a hug or something like that. And then what the child learns is that it's, it's the outcome that matters, not the process. Yeah. And, and they're trying to get perfect scores to get that outcome. And, and, and that is the problem. That, that's the, the perfectionism is the problem here. Demanding that we be better than we are is what leads to low self-esteem. And if you're trying, trying to uh, get perfect scores, then you won't challenge yourself. Right, it, because you know that if you challenge yourself and you do something hard, you're not going to get it right. You're going to fail, and and that's a necessary part of learning. But when kids become afraid of failure, and they're not rewarded for their efforts, efforts they're only rewarded for the outcome. Uh, then I believe that they would become more likely uh, to become depressed to define themselves based on you know I'm worthless if I'm not tremendously successful, or I'm worthless if I don't get that A. Uh, as opposed to, I'm worthwhile because I, I challenged myself. I tried a new subject that was unfamiliar to me, and I, I learned a lot through that failure. And, and for parents to feel proud of their children for trying and being curious and exploring, and it, even if there's a lot of failure involved, that is, in fact, the fastest road to success, is through failure. And if we can accept it with a light heart, then we can learn at a very rapid rate. Uh, but I think in a lot of cases, children are not rewarded for their effort and for failing. Uh, they're, they're rewarded for being good in some other outcome type of sense. And how does it, Matt, work in a real adult life? Because, um, you know, if you work for in very challenging work, like like always say the same example, like surgeon, I'm very like always in admiration for doctors and because I broke my backbone, I feel very always grateful that I feel that somebody saved me. And if he would make mistake on me and I would not walk, that would be absolutely devastating for me. So there are some jobs and some, some things that we should not make a mistake because that costs a lot. So I was wondering from what you said, which is very clear that we should award for the process, for trying, for, for putting in effort, not for outcome. But what do you do in this kind of jobs or situation when you actually a little bit have to succeed? Like exactly. when yeah. you, the life is, is like, is dependent on you. When you send people to the moon, if you made a mistake and you're just trying and people will die. Like trying is just not good enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So one one of the and and the same is true. Not, it's not only in surgery, but it's, let, let's take the the practice of psychotherapy. Yeah. The stakes can be huge there. A person's mental health is on the line, and and whether or not they remain depressed for the rest of their life or they recover, uh, is dependent on the skill set that the therapist is bringing to the table. Absolutely. And it's and it's, it's uh, my opinion that that skill set is determined by what, what happens in the therapy, what, what the therapist is doing at any given time is determined by how frequently they have practiced those skills and how recently they have practiced those skills. And, and if they haven't practiced a lot and failed a lot and learned from those failures, they're not going to achieve a high level of proficiency and skill. And, and when people say, well, why are team therapists getting all these great results and, you know, the therapy's working nine, ten times faster than other therapy? It's because of this deliberate practice model that's built into team where we, we train and we train and we train. And, and David would always tell us the second best thing you could do would be a perfect job when you're, when you're training and practicing. Uh, the best thing that you could do would be to fail and learn from it. And, and with that model in mind, uh, you can, again, get to rapid learning states before you enter the therapy room or the uh, start doing surgery. 
It's because you've practiced and practiced and practiced. And, and if, if people aren't willing to practice and, and engage uh, with, there's a type of learning called deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the absence of that, they're not going to achieve high levels of skill and they'll make a lot of errors. Uh, it's, it's better to make those errors during practice than when someone's life is on the line. Uh, so that, that's one answer to your question. Can you explain more what does it mean, deliberate practice? Yeah, so deliberate practice um, is something actually that it's been going on for quite some some time. Uh, but uh, in, in psychotherapy training, deliberate practice would mean oftentimes we would be in a role play uh, where one person would be pretending to be a patient and the other person who's, who's training and practicing uh, would pretend to be the therapist. And, the, and then you would practice different components of therapy. So, uh, I, you know, I did countless hours of this during my training with David of what, what would be like a challenging thing that a patient might say that I wouldn't know how to respond to. And then I'd make my best effort uh, to respond mm -hmm. to that patient. And then I would get immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. And then I would get a chance to try it again. And it was okay to fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and revise each time until the skill set improved uh, to the point where it was like, wow, that was perfect. That was exactly what that patient would have needed to hear in that moment uh, to feel better. Uh, so that, that's what del that's deliberate practice. It's, it's this uh, fail, effort, failure, feedback, and then repeat. So in this model, does it mean that there is no space for feeling you know, like really shitty about yourself that you failed, that you failed or that you screwed up. You always should say, well, this happened, but I'm going to, uh, next time I'm going to try better. Uh, well, I think that, um, that too is a habit, meaning, um, I don't try to dictate to anybody how they should be thinking. And if, if someone is, um, that that turns out not to be that helpful and in, in fact can be counterproductive if i were to tell you never uh, never beat up on yourself never criticize yourself um it may become that uh, tempting thing to do uh rather than just listening listening to that that advice and then it's also not that simple when again when people have a negative thought like like i should be better or i'm worthless it's held in place by multiple forms of resistance. Mm -hmm. And without, without addressing those, it's not helpful just to simply demand that, that you be more optimistic and upbeat, is we have to uh, explore that resistance and understand it and at some level surrender to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we'll start to see that there's a really beautiful part of our values that, are, that is connected to this, these negative feelings. That, that when we're feeling, we're, when we're beating up on ourselves, a lot of times it's based on love. Like I don't, I care about my patients. I don't want to fail them and to hurt them. And I, if if I could beat up on myself and, and protect them, I would, right? And so I might get tempted into mm -hmm. a self-criticism for a variety of different reasons. Like sometimes it's just honesty, right? Like I, I feel like I'm just being brutally honest with myself if mm -hmm. I'm beating up on myself. Or I might feel like I don't deserve to feel good about myself. If I'm not performing up to the standard, if I'm letting people down, what gives me the right to enjoy my life? And, and I feel like a moral, morally compelled uh, to feel bad and, and beat up on myself. And these, these motivational uh, barriers are lurking in the background. They're not easy to see. Uh, and, so, and so it takes some skill to be able to identify them. Uh, and, and work through them. So this is where we're getting to the very important question. Self-esteem is something that is a little bit intangible. Like it's not like one thing. You just, you just, what is it exactly how you feel when you have low self-esteem? What kind of thoughts patients usually have who come to you with a low self-esteem? Yeah, let's, let's look at that uh, terrain a little bit together. Julia, that's a great mm -hmm. question. Um, when, when people have low self-esteem, uh, sometimes it's just they're telling themselves, I'm worthless. 
and and it's just obvious. Uh, everyone should be able to see at a glance that I'm just no good, I'm worthless, I'm broken, I'm defective, and that that could be the thinking. Mm-hmm. And then and then there's another position which is more of a contingent worth that I'm worthwhile if I'm successful enough, or I'm worthwhile if I'm popular enough, mm-hmm. or, or attractive enough, or have in, so, some external thing. I is uh, I'm basing my worth on having that. When I'm gonna lose ten pounds, that yeah. Practice. yeah, and then and then sometimes people do succeed. They lose 10 pounds, and then they start to think, oh, I am worthwhile now because I have this certain physique where the, now I've got the body that I, that I thought uh, is a worthwhile body. Now, th- the problem with this is that it's a setup. Uh, it's, it's a bit like a hamster wheel mm-hmm. uh, where you might achieve that sense of uh, worth for a moment, but it'll be taken away the next moment, right? Uh, that, you know, you can... Let's say you're a investor, right? You can feel like, oh, I, I'm, I'm amazing. I'm the most brilliant investor in the world because I, my stocks went up today. But the very next moment, those stops, stocks could go down and you could be telling yourself, I'm a worthless idiot. How could I have ever thought that I was a, a skilled investor when I'm losing this mon- money? And, and so this form of worth is precarious. It, it comes and goes. And there's a higher level of self-esteem, uh, which is just based on the decision to love and accept ourselves as, as flawed, mm-hmm. vulnerable humans and, and to join humanity. We're all flawed, and, and, and that's, that's not the problem. The problem is saying we shouldn't be. The problem is demanding that we should be better. And, and, and shouldn't be better, Matt? Shouldn't be better? Isn't the goal of all of this... Uh, self-help movement and growth that we should be better like it's saying you be the best version of yourself upgrade yourself uh, isn't it everything about being better yeah I, I don't buy I don't buy into that I, I would I would think if if we're treating depression or low self-esteem the idea would be to feel better we would know that we were successful when we start to feel better and the demand that we should improve I mean that's nice Improvement is nice, and it's and it's. I think it's a good value system, even to to be growing and learning. Uh, but demanding it is the problem, and basing our worth on it is the is the problem. Uh, and so, the higher level of self esteem is when we accept ourselves exactly the way we are. We're not uh, demanding reality uh, be the way we think it should be. We're living in reality, and and that's also a Buddhist concept. We're awake. We're not, uh, and we're in reality. We're having experience rather than judging uh, our experience or ourselves in that experience. Um, and and then a couple other things about self-esteem. Some people will have excessive self-esteem. They'll yes. think they're special and better, and they deserve more, and and everyone should be praising mm-hmm. them. And yeah. this is a huge problem. Not as many people present to uh, therapy for this problem. Yes. Uh, right. They 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 may. <laughs> Uh, you know, complain that they're not having very good, very much success in relationships, and, and may may see, seek out help for that. Uh, you used to have people, president like this. Yes, yes, indeed, and and uh, throughout history, we we've had, you know, uh, uh, people with big egos out there thinking they're special and they're the yeah. kings, and everyone should do what they think uh, is right. And so that's another esteem, kind of self-esteem type of problem. Um. And then there, there's one other concept that might be worth sharing, which is once once you get self-esteem, let it go. Uh, when you when you have some sense of worth, the next step is to is to not need it. Realize that you don't need worth. That that's just a an illusion, and, and it, it doesn't really give us anything. And once we don't need to be special. Uh, then the whole universe becomes special. Then we can live in the universe then without needing to be any different uh, than we are. And I think a related concept um, is is realizing we don't have a self, that that's just a word uh, that we're saying. And, but that's a little more more complicated of a 
topic to get into. But how can you, in a world where we all try to be special, say, well, you you don't need to be anybody special. Like where then where do you hook then on yourself if if you're not special? What do you mm-hmm. try to be? Like like ev- like everybody else? Like how do you how do you enhance your uniqueness or your talents if you're saying, Well, I'm nobody special? Well and if no- you don't need to be, I, I I'm nobody special. I just enjoy uh, getting a chance to talk to Julia and to meet you and to learn from you and have this time together. Um, and I don't need to buy into some expectation from society telling me who I should be or how I should be. And, and if, if someone is demanding, you know, you should be more special, uh, why should I listen to them? Why should I give up uh, my joy and happiness in order to uh, meet their expectations? What if this is your expectations? Because we're often talking about pressure, but if this is like when we feel special, we 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 do feel nicer. Yeah. Like it's it's a nice feeling. So also my question is if you have this attitude that I absolutely believe that makes us more happy because it makes us more serene and we don't have this pressure or we don't have something that we're hunting for. But then is it possible to achieve any greatness? Like to to prosper if you have this attitude isn't it true that like word is moved by people who are very ambitious who do not accept things as they are and they push it well yeah i mean i think i think we we've covered that a little bit already that uh demanding that we be special will lead to depression and we know <laughs> we know based on the evidence that depression is not lead to higher levels of productivity you don't you don't see depressed people uh, achieving a tremendous amount in the world. Einstein wasn't, you know, depressed. He was just really curious, and he, and he worked hard, and he was really interested in how the universe worked. And, it, and at no level did he need to be beating up on himself. That that would have just been a distraction. Um, I think there's another part of your question I might not quite be answering. So what are you saying here, Earl, that it's not ambition, but curiosity that more drives the world forward and our achievement forward? Exactly. Like I don't like life is an experiment and we don't control the outcomes, but, uh-huh. but we, we, we can explore and be interested in, in almost almost everything we do, in fact, results in some different outcome than we expected. And, mm-hmm. Right. And and. We don't have the ability to predict exactly what's going to happen. So we're sort of experimenting. Mm-hmm. And, and and if we're open to experimentation, then failure is just an unexpected result. And it's <laughs> something we can learn from and, and be intrigued by and say, oh, wow, that's interesting. How did that? And then we'll learn something about ourselves and our reality uh, through that approach. That is very beautiful what you're saying. And now the the question is, how do you work on it? Like if you, because we live in a world where we all being saying that we're special. We as the parents always repeat our kids that they're special. I repeat my child every day that he's special, but obviously I don't want him to be narcissistic and I don't want him to feel, you know, too special that he does not respect others. So if you, don't feel special very often. You feel unspecial. You feel like you're like nobody important. How do you work on this balance that you said that you don't push yourself into being special and you have some, but you also in the same time do not feel unspecial. So if you have some balancing emotions in your head that you feel good about just being who you are how do you start working on it do you have any techniques any methods how we all can do on everyday basis to work on it yeah and there are dozens and dozens in in the team model one thing i love about it is that we have over 200 different methods and 50 that we use commonly to help people overcome low self-esteem and maybe we could list a few of those uh, for, for your listening audience that, that they could try out on their own. Right. And so, for example, if let's say they're saying I, their negative thoughts might be, I'm not special. I'm nobody. I, I, should, I should be more special. And they're mm-hmm. really disturbed by that. 
the, the first step would just be to write that down on a daily mood log, right? To, to trap our thoughts on paper as a first step gives us power over them because, you know, our thoughts are just coming at us all the time, kind of like a swarm of mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we can start to address one thought over here and then we'll get attacked by another thought over there. And so it's important to use tools like the daily mood log uh, to record our thoughts and our feelings. Uh, and, and, and so that's a first step. And David, David Burns has an excellent podcast as well. And he has many episodes where he describes these methods and he talks about the use of the daily mood log. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's what I do. If I'm if I'm having a crummy day and I'm feeling down on myself, I'll I'll just take out a piece of paper and I'll start writing down what am I telling myself. And 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 that's the first step. Um, let, let's talk about some other uh, methods that that you can use there. So, could, do you want to pick a thought? Some examples uh, that people struggle, and you can help me with this very specific examples. Yeah. What would be what would be one thought that people might have that would create low self esteem or feelings of worthlessness or inadequacy that we could use just to, to, as a sample thought to practice with? Well, the thing that you call very nicely mosquitoes, like one of this mosquito thing, is comparing ourselves. So this one thought is I'm worse than him because, for example, now we all worried about our kids getting on social media or even us getting on social media. We're blogging, we're doing different stuff. So we're saying, well, if I'm that smart, if I'm that interesting, if I have something to say, how come my content is not as popular as this celebrity who has like nothing to say, just showing off with her, you know, beautiful body. And um, we feel that if we don't get enough likes, enough followers, we are not as good. We are worthless because others give us proof that we are not interesting because they don't like us. They don't share us. They don't follow us. They don't talk to us. How do we work with this comparing mosquitoes? Well, yeah, and the answer to your question is, is a little complicated because there are multiple steps even in the agenda setting part here, but we need to first pick out one moment in time where, where you were feeling worthless and telling yourself, you know, I'm not as good as this other person over there. I'm not as popular as them. I'm not as smart or special or interesting, etc. And then write, write each of those thoughts on paper. You know, I'm, I'm worse than her. Uh, I'm not as smart as them. I'm not as interesting or popular as those folks over okay. there, to, to get those thoughts on paper would be a good first step. And then, uh, and then we could do something, we could practice something called the magic button, uh, where we'd ask ourselves, let, let's say that we, we could just feel radically better right now, and it took no effort. Our mm-hmm. circumstances wouldn't change. We wouldn't be more popular. We wouldn't be more beautiful but our depression would go away. Our self-esteem would shoot through the roof. We'd start to really feel confident and good about ourselves. Uh, Would would you press that button is is one question. And many people will say, yeah, absolutely. I want to press that button. I want to feel better. And I, I like to say, well, let's pause there for a minute. Because I, I believe you could feel better, and I, and I believe there are many methods here that could help you feel better uh, very rapidly. Uh, but I'm a little hesitant because I see all these thoughts as saying really wonderful things about you. And, and, and I wonder if you see what I'm talking about. And then we would make a list on a separate sheet of paper. What does it say that's awesome about this human being that they're comparing themselves and they're telling themselves, you know, I'm not as smart as them. I'm not as interesting as them. And we'd start to see, oh, well, they've got a humble quality to themselves. They've got a realistic quality to themselves. Mm-hmm. They're they're realistically appraising themselves. They're they're motivated, right? They they want to they want to stand out. They want they want to get all the good stuff in life that popularity has to bring. They want to be special, so they're highly highly motivated and have very high standards for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
and we would start to admire the, the, the depression in a way. We would start to admire these negative thoughts and the negative feelings associated with them. Like, is it a good thing to want to be smart? And to be it's a great motivated. Thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, to, to be curious, to want to learn. Yeah. And, and, and like, every single emotion has positive values attached to it. So, for example, if someone is feeling ashamed, do you, do you know what that says that's wonderful about them? Being ashamed, yes. It's like being ashamed telling you that you can, you know, you can do something better, right? Yeah, you could do something better. And there's a kind of awareness of others' expectations, too. <laughs> Is it good to be aware of others' expectations? To be kind of tuned in to what other mm -hmm. people want from us? To be sensitive to what, what other people need from us? Is it good? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was always thinking that maybe it's not that good. Maybe we are too aware yeah. of what other people want from us. And it's actually... Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Like, why is it that matters? You can, like, I think that from, from my perspective, the, the most stable self-esteem is that you really don't care. That's why I think all this uh, celebrity who bragging about, oh, I'm so brave. I went uh, on a party without makeup. It's like, so what? If you're brave, it means you're scared. If you're scared, it means you're afraid of opinion. If you're afraid of opinion, it means that you care about this opinion. If you care for opinion, it means that that is actually relevant to you, not that you really like don't care. And I think what we should strive for, like not taking care and uh like whatever, we should take care of somebody's feelings, but not somebody's opinion. Yeah, and notice what, what happened there, Julia. I was trying mm -hmm. to persuade you how what a wonderful thing it is to have yeah. these high, high standards and and, mm. and and to want to improve and, and be better, et cetera. And that's the moment. It's, it's when we started to explore the resistance, the reasons why we mm -hmm. don't want to change, that people often have these types of breakthroughs. Uh, but we have to go through that process. We have to look at the advantages to beating up on ourselves, the perceived advantages and the perceived good qualities, the real good qualities that are connected uh, to our shame or our worthless feelings. And, and there's something about that that kind of loosens up these thoughts and allows yeah. us to de defeat them. And, can yeah. person do it without therapist? Uh, yes, you can. There, there's good evidence for many of the self-help books that David Burns has, has written uh, being as effective and longer lasting than antidepressant medication. Um, and his new book, I think, is particularly wonderful uh, because it's bringing in this concept of positive reframing, of seeing the, the beauty and the values of, of the, the upsetting feelings that we have. So my question is, why is it so important to write down? Why we cannot just have a thought and contemplate this thought, like on meditation? Why notebook and pen is so important in this process of change? Yeah, well, I think in part because it is a process of, of change. And I don't know if you remember this, but it, when, when I was learning long division, when you're trying to divide a big number like what's 7,359 divided by 13. If you try to do that in your head, you'll get lost. Your your likelihood of, of failing at one of the operations there uh, goes up quite a bit. But having it on paper that you can look at it, check your work, go back to where you got lost or stuck, and, and, and keep going from that point allows you to make consistent uh, progress. Mm -hmm. and, and again, part of the, the process in it, it is it is a process, you know, first we have to look at what is the outcome resistance and then we'd have to see what is the process resistance uh, and then and then try multiple different methods uh, to, to crack the code on one negative thought. Mm -hmm. And then once one, once we defeat that thought, then we'd want to write down the new thoughts too and, and remeasure emotions. And so there's a there's a kind of a science behind this and a, and a process uh, that it's easy to get lost in. Um, and one, one other answer to that is uh, specificity is an important ingredient uh, to, to recovery. When, when people are uh, depressed, they have this kind of vague way of thinking that I'm just always a loser. I fail at everything. Nothing ever goes my way. 
But if you can pinpoint one moment in time, let's, let's talk about one moment in time where things weren't going your way, uh, then uh, you can actually start to defeat those thoughts that are in that moment. Uh, but it requires that laser-like specificity uh, to get traction. It's kind of like putting uh, our, th our thinking under the microscope. Uh, and that's what gives us the ability to see through it and defeat it. Mm -hmm. I also believe in writing. Like I have millions of notebooks and I, I don't even start reading or listening to podcasts if I don't have a notebook. For me, it's like... Yeah. It does not work this way. That's why I can't understand how can you listen to podcasts and drive. Then I just, I personally become very, not a very good driver when I do that. That's why <laughs> I don't really listen to uh, to podcasts or anything. Um, you said something very important about um, um, about feeling uh, feeling good about yourself and having like very stable self-esteem is that power of should when you have a lot of shoulds there's very difficult to feel okay to feel that you are not defected is it any methods any techniques how can we start working on shoulds oh that's a great question julia yeah uh, there are many different methods that could be helpful for a should statement uh, the the should statement is one of the classic distortions uh, Al Albert Ellis was one of the folks who wrote a lot about should statements, um, and it, it can cut both ways. A should, a should statement can be directed at ourselves, and we could be saying, I should be better, uh, and, and, and we could be feeling guilty or defective or bad, but it can go the other way too. We could be saying, They're, they should be better, that person over there, and so it can al also result in feelings of anger and outrage. Mm -hmm. um, and and so how do we defeat should statements? Uh, well, what one one simple way is is something called the semantic technique, and that's where we would replace. Um, we realize that the the one way in which shoulds are distorted is its excessively loud language. It's language that's out of gear. We don't need to demand that we be better. We can just I say it would be lovely if I were better. I'd love to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how do I? How would I do that? How do I get better? I'm curious, and, and uh, to to use language that's more lighthearted, like oh yeah, I'm, I'd be excited uh, to, to improve at that, or that would be fantastic. I would love it if uh, this this happened. Uh, <laughs> instead of should must demand those kind of demands. I can't imagine that this is a good technique, for example, if you feel, I don't know, like a bad parent. It's like, oh, I, I should spend more time with my kids. I should play with them more. And this is how it's going to work. What happens if you as a parent want some things for your child that you really feel he should? Like he should study if he more if he wants to get to university. If he is an athlete, he should practice more. He should be on a diet. How do you talk to your child when you don't use this should and when you lower this expectation, but in the same time, uh, some things just has to be done. And um, if, or yeah. if, if your child is sick and he should take his medicine or he should take care of himself. So, and he does not want to. So how do we work on this should that it's not really should, but somebody has to do it? Yeah. Well, first of all, parents would want to have, would, would want, would have to want to change that way of thinking. And, and oftentimes parents won't want to change that thinking because they imagine if I don't, if I don't tell my child what they should be doing, they're not going to do it and then they're going to have a worse life. Again, there's a, a, a motivational component to this is parents often think I need to kind of get angry and force my children in, into yeah. doing what I, what I want them uh, to do and it's for their own good that, that I'm getting angry with them and yelling. At, at them, and I, I'm still of the opinion that that's less effective uh, than letting kids know we just love them no matter what. And there's this awesome thing out there that if you, if you learn how to do this, then, then these other doors will open, and we can ex it, it, learning becomes this uh, f um, fire that you start start to feed rather than an, a vessel you're trying to fill and cram information into. And, and so I think what parents uh, optimally are doing is they're uh, stimulating their children's curiosity and interest in learning 
rather than trying to force things on them. Uh, when, we, when we try to force things on people, that's when they'll reject and rebel against us. But that's all smart. Yeah. But now, in the end of the day, you have child who loves teenager, who loves his PlayStation or whatever games. <laughs> and if he's not going to start studying, he's going to fail his exam. And then you're going to stay with him at home because he's not going to get to university. And you have to support him for the rest of his life. And you don't want this for yourself and you don't want this for your child. So what exactly, how do you support him? You cannot say, well, I would love you to study, but if you choose to play PlayStation, that's fine by me. Like, you don't really feel, it's not really authentic for you. That would be a lie. How do you, what do you do in this kind of situation? It, uh, it's a great question, Julia, and I think it's very dependent on the, on the, uh, the relationship between the, the parent and the child and the age of the child. I think it's good to, like, if, if some, like, my kids love to play video games and stuff like that on their iPad, and we just have certain rules around the house that, you know, when you've done this and that, when you've done your homework and you've you've done that, then you get the reward uh, of using your iPad. And so you can create structure. That's, that's a fine thing to do as a parent at, at a certain age range. But then I think as kids get, get older, more and more we have to accept that we don't have control over their their behavior. And, and maybe we can just, you know, there are some radical examples of when kids get kind of tied up in very bad behavior, uh, you know, using alcohol or drugs. And, and that can be an opportunity for a, just, just a conversation, a heart to heart with our children to say, you know, I love you uh, deeply and I'm scared for you I'm, and, and I'm worried for you. And I think I'm part of the problem because here I, I've allowed you to stay in the home and I've supported you and, and I've made it real easy for you to to drink alcohol and to do drugs and and to play video games all day long, and I haven't challenged you, and, I, and, and that's that's on me. I, I failed you in that way, and, and I'm not going to be doing that anymore. And, and need to let you know that if you'd want to go back to school, if you'd want to get your degree, I'd support you a hundred percent. But if you wanted to play video games and you wanted to, to drink alcohol and do drugs, I won't be supporting you anymore uh, because I don't think that would be good for you and I would probably start to resent it. Um, and so you can use empathy as well as uh, a kind of gentle ultimatum uh, with children who are caught up in bad habits and, and just not, not support them in, in continuing those bad habits. Say, well, I'd support you to get help, I'd support you to go back to school but I'm not willing to keep paying your electricity bill and for new video games and, and giving you cash to go buy drugs with. That's, that's hurting you and I can't do it anymore. It's, it's, I'm too, feeling too guilty about it. And so mm -hmm. parent, parents, when parents can identify how they're the problem rather than trying to tell the other person that you, know, you should change, that's, that's when miracles start to happen in a relationship uh, and, and in therapy too. That is a great thought that you said about uh, relationships. So let's uh, get it into relationship with our partner because sometimes this is like part of parents first is also take care of their relationship with their partner to feel like they're like w we are the f fundamental for the family. So the love and passion and companionship is important for, for our family. And sometimes we have some disagreement also on a level of values. So for example, man works traditionally and he comes back home and he wants a little bit, you know, to rest or like to, to, to get his shit together because he was after a hard day of work. Woman feels like, I was all day uh, with my kids. You should come back and like immediately exchange me and start taking care of the kids because you were at work with adults and I'm too tired. So you should do it immediately. So he said, I will do it. I just need an hour break because I'm also was working. He said, no, because you were nine, eight hours in your break with adults <laughs> and I had not this break. So what do you do? They both say you should do and, 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 and they're stuck. Yeah, yeah. That, so that's so relationship problems are complicated, and there's one one cause for all relationship problems, and um, and 
Do you, do you know what I'm going to say, Julia? Have, you may have covered this on another podcast. Tell me. Okay, so the, the cause of relationship problems is blame. And that those, both people are demanding that the other person change. And neither, okay. neither party is looking at what they're doing to cause mm -hmm. the problem in the relationship. And, and instead of having a, a, an intimate conversation about what they're feeling mm. and, try, and trying to understand what the other person is feeling, they're, they're making demands and they're tell, demand, demanding the other person do this and do that. Mm. And that, that will fail. That will cause relationships to fail and, mm. and, and for people to be more and more angry with each other uh, as they're not being understood. They're being uh, kind of shamed and bullied. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so the five secrets of effective communication are a structured way of communicating that we can practice uh, so that in the heat of the moment, we have the skills to, to respond uh, to our partner. Yeah. And, so, and the, the interesting thing is either member of the party uh, could resolve the relationship problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and both members of, of the party, if they're in an argument, both people are 100% to blame for it. Mm -hmm. And so if one person takes on the role of saying, wait a minute, you know, you're right. I, I, I've spent some time with the, the kiddos on the weekend, and it is extremely draining. You must be exhausted. And you're, you're probably waiting all day long for me to get home so I could give you a break. And here I've been selfishly just thinking of me rather than what your day has been like. What, what are you feeling? You, you must be feeling pretty worn out and angry with me uh, for, for expecting I want to prop my feet up after you've been working so hard all day long. Tell me about that. And, and, to, and then the woman too, uh, the woman could say to her husband, I, I, I probably don't appreciate you enough. I, I, didn't, I don't know what your day was like. And it was, I'm imagining it was quite stressful. And I so appreciate all you do for the family and, and you're a wonderful father and and, and, and it makes sense why you would want to rest and have some relaxation. And, and when people go to the emotions rather than uh, arguing and, and blaming the other person, uh, that's, that's when things start to cool down. And blame is a funny thing. Once one person starts to grab for it, then the other person wants some too. Mm. And, and we start yeah. ping pong game. That's right. That's right. I call the strategy what you uh, what you described uh, love first. If we choose happiness and love for the other person as our priority, so we feel I cannot feel happy if you're not happy. Like your happiness is literally part of my happiness. Right. Then you just really want to solve it, and then you don't start. You what you should do? Say this is how I feel. Let like let's talk how you feel and what kind of solution we can find because if you put the blame first and how you want to design this person then it's never going to work because we don't like to be we're not like you know this little thing on a chessboard we don't like to be move around and say do this do that do that we're just human beings and it's important for us to see that other person cares and if in a relationship our happiness and our is priority for the other person this is how it's going to work and then it's f in from my perspective not even a technique this is an attitude that we could have and we should we should have <laughs> in a in relation yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know i love what you're saying there julia another way of talking about this is is to realize that the the cause of relationship problems is solutions mm. it's when you're when you're trying to solve a problem rather than connect in a, in a loving, caring way uh, to that other person, that that's when we get into trouble. And the solutions kind of fall out in, into the daylight. People, When people are motivated and, and see the other person suffering and understand them, then, mm -hmm. they, then suddenly the man will say, no, I want you to rest. I want you to rest. And the mm -hmm. woman will say, no, I want you to rest. Because they have such deep compassion uh, for mm -hmm. each other's suffering. My favorite psychologist, Vatslavik, was, who was specialized in problems, he was always saying the solution is in the problem. The, the biggest problem that we have in communication that we define problem that is not really a problem. 
It's not a problem that is resting or not resting. The problem is how can we make that we both are happy? So if you define problem right, it's much easier to find a solution. But very often we are stuck in ourself and in, in our small world and we cannot see outside of this. In the end of the day, if our relationship fails, whole family fails. So it should be always defined by um, safe relationship first. Yeah, and, the, and this is... It's um, easier said than done, too, mm -hmm. because um, uh, blame is a very tenacious uh, and sticky substance. It's very addictive. And when, when people are blaming, they don't want to let go of it. No. Yeah, and, and we can look at the something called, the again, the outcome resistance to letting go of blame. Like you, We can have good relationships, uh, but are we willing... To let go of all these advantages of blaming other people, because if if I'm if I'm blaming someone else, that takes me off the hook. It's yeah. their fault. That it's their fault, not mine. And I can feel righteous and superior mm. to them, and I've got permission to look down on them, and I can feel powerful as I punish them. There are all these. Um, there's a dark side of human nature here in in blame, and if we don't. And if we're not aware of, oh my gosh, it's tempting. Blame this blame mm -hmm. stuff is luring us in. We get addicted to blame, and if, you know, we need to. If we want to get out, we have to understand it. We have to understand why it's so seductive. We also very often have this habit of feeling a victim, because if we feel a victim, then somebody is that it's always somebody has fault. That if we're uh, a victim, then we deserve the all goodness from others because we are such a saint and we're being so mistreated. So sometimes we're just droning in our um, joy of being a victim, even so we say, oh, we don't want it. But there are some advantages of being a victim. And this is what often happens in toxic relationship when we're staying, for example, with an alcoholic. We are the saint who, like, who can survive so much with such a horrible person. And we like it sometimes. Yeah, well, we can have a, yeah, that sense of moral superiority can be so seductive and and, um, and is a part of why people blame. And, yeah. Yeah. And so that that's we've covered a lot of ground here. It, um, Julia, how 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 are you feeling about the the podcast so far? Are you getting your questions answered? Well, I am uh, feeling that it was went even better than I expected because I like that we went from uh, from self esteem to blame. So we cover kids, we cover relationship, and even dolphins. And who would not love dolphins? So exactly, I'm yeah. really <laughs> covered so much, and I'm very grateful to you. In case you don't know, Matt May. Finished Stanford, which is my favorite university, as I was telling almost on every podcast. So you definitely should <laughs> should listen to Matt because he knows what he's saying. Stanford is the best psychology school in the whole universe. Oh, Julia, thank you. That's very, very <laughs> kind of you to say. I really enjoyed our, our time together and uh, hope your listeners uh, gain something from, from our conversation. I really hope so. And whatever questions you have, please comment below and I will ask Matt to answer if I will not be able to answer myself. So Matt, thank you so much for uh, having finding time to uh, to cover so many important subjects for all of us. We're all struggling sometimes with self-esteem. We're playing blame game and we don't know what we should do with our teenagers. Even so I'm still far from this. My son is just three, but... I do have problems sometimes. So thank you, Matt, so, so much. I'm very grateful. My pleasure, Julia. Thank you again. Thank you.